This meeting is being recorded. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I did have a couple of announcements and then we'll turn it over to our guest alumni speaker, Ryan, another Ryan. Um, so just to let everyone know, um, this Friday, the Academic Commons, the library's group that gives training workshops and stuff for students and faculty, will have the intro to GIS workshop. So if you find today's presentation interesting, there'll be a workshop coming up on Friday. You can register through library.gwu.edu. On next Tuesday, they have a workshop on Tableau. On next Thursday, they have a workshop on video editing. Then on Monday the 23rd, they have an introduction to Python workshop. And then in two weeks, building off of our same topic as today, they actually have a workshop focused on um, ArcPy for GIS. Uh, so that will be on October 5th. So there's quite a few workshops coming up through the library um, that are related to coding and different coding topics. So you can take a look at those. Again, all those are library.gwu.edu. The Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship also asked that I mentioned that they have a storytelling workshop that you can sign up for uh, on their website. So that's how they tell stories about projects you're working on, um, technologies you're developing and so forth. And then on October 6th, they're also planning to have a meetup so people can get uh, more information about the programs being offered through the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. They run a lot of really good programs, so it's worth taking a look at. Um, a couple other announcements. In Slack, I posted a free machine learning book yesterday that some people might want to take a look at. Um, it was sent through a different listserv, but it was a good resource um, on the basics of machine learning. It starts out with a really good chapter on terminology, so it's useful if you're just getting used to the machine learning terminology. Also, for anyone who's a master's student, an MS student who's gonna be graduating in the spring, if you're considering doing a PhD, um, talk to me. Our program is starting to accept applications between now and mid-January. Um, and I can tell you more about what we do in our small PhD program. The only other announcement I have, and then I'll see if anyone else has announcements, is in two weeks, just so that everyone know, um, our intended topic is to talk about high-performance computing. Um, we still have to verify with the guest speaker who's sitting next to me um, that we're going to have that. If not, we will can move it to later and we may switch a different topic in. We have several things coming up on the agenda though. Are there any other announcements that people want to share before we move into today's talk? Yes, Mike. Hey everyone, how's it going? Um, last session, I asked if anybody was interested in maybe doing some hack nights and we did get some responses. And so um, I just dropped a poll in Slack in the events channel asking folks like, well, when's a good time generally for us to do those hack nights? So uh, I'd love to see folks respond to that poll if you're interested. And then afterwards, we'll kind of maybe move forward with one of the top times or the top two times we could kind of um uh rotate or something like that but that poll is in the events channel so thanks everyone and you could pick multiple times as well great uh it's great to have someone who's organizing that so any other announcements anything john i think I feel like there's something that is happening i'm forgetting right now well if it comes up later <laughs> we can um so with that, I want to turn it over to our presenter today to talk about what he's been doing. Um, so Ryan is a graduate of the geography program here at GW, and that's where he got introduced to coding and Python. I guess if you want to talk a little bit about your background, Ryan, and then you can jump right in. I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Uh, thanks, Ryan. I'll turn my camera on here just for the introduction. Then. Uh... 
turn it back off so I'm not distracting myself. Uh, as uh, Ryan said, I am a 2019 graduate of the Geography Master's program at George Washington. Before that, uh, I graduated from William & Mary with a geography degree. And while I was at um, George Washington, I really focused a lot on those technical courses in geography, GIS, uh, coding, um, remote sensing, that sort of thing. So when I graduated from uh, George Washington, I went to work for uh, a local company in Northern Virginia as a GIS analyst there. And then about three or four months ago, I switched over to uh, a company called Niam IT, which is N-I-Y-A-M IT. And um, the presentation I'll be doing today is about some of the Python uh, coding that I worked on when I uh, first got it started here, um, which employs uh, a lot of pandas and a lot of ArcPy. So um, I definitely re reiterate Ryan's call. If you're interested in GIS, definitely get some, some introductory classes under your belt. It's, it's, a, it's a field that has a lot of different applications um, from government to industry and everything in between. Um, so I will get started. Happy to be here. All right, so um, the company I work for, Neum, is a FEMA contractor, um, along with many other contracts. And the project that I was working on uh, a few months ago when I first came to the company had to do with the uh, FEMA software called Hazus, H-A-Z-U-S. Hazus is FEMA's hazard mitigation software. You can see the, the highlighted row up there, hazard mitigation planning reduces loss of life uh, and property by minimizing the impact of disasters. Uh, and basically about 20 years ago, FEMA was tasked with creating uh, a hazard mitigation software that would serve as uh, the primary system whereby local governments uh, and state governments and tribal governments uh, could prove that they had hazard mitigation plans uh, in effect to receive uh, FEMA, FEMA uh, funds for certain disaster uh, assistance. So basically, Hazus is um, a software run through the ArcGIS platform, and you can see uh, FEMA assumes that uh, the types of people that are using this largely work for uh, local governments, especially agencies that are going to deal with emergency preparedness. Um, but we also have academic institutions in here, students uh, and uh, general GIS staff. So Hazus uh, again works through the Esri or GIS uh, desktop and has four different uh, models, earthquakes, Floods, yes. And I, can you zoom in on the screen like a lot? Uh, a lot. Okay. So we can, I can't read it more. How's that? I guess it looks different on my end than yours. Yeah, yeah. it's still pretty small. There's a, it, we're on like a very wide screen here. So you can go. Yeah, that's pretty good. All right, that's better. Thank Thanks. You. Okay. <clears throat> sure. And, and uh, I won't be on this PDF for too much longer, but definitely reiterate that as I move to uh, the code later or uh, GIS. Thank you. Um, so as you can see, there are four different um, types of disasters that uh, people using this software um, can uh, model for earthquakes, floods, tsunamis, and hurricanes. And uh, depending on the jurisdiction that you select, um, either US state, DC territories, or uh, even lower census tracts or uh, census blocks, um, that, that might limit um, which models that you're able to uh, plan for. Um, you're not gonna be able to predict a tsunami in, in the middle of the country, for instance. So um, as part of the data that HASIS uh, comes standard with is uh, decennial census data related to um, population and, and demographics. So I've, I've opened um, a, a HASIS um, program for DC here. 
Um, and you can see that uh, I selected that I wanted to uh, have a study region of census blocks. And when you choose that, it also comes with the census tracts uh, and the, you know, kind of statewide, district-wide uh, layer here. And if we go up uh, into inventory, and, and again, you can see this is, if you're familiar with um, ArcGIS, this is, this is an, a, like a custom uh, ArcGIS software here. So um, HASIS is loaded with a bunch of standard data related to um, building information, uh, related to transportation systems. I was, I was tasked with, uh, when I first started at my company, validating the, the census data, the baseline census data from 2020. So for the last 10 years, HASIS has come baseline with uh, 2010 census data. Now that the 2020 census data is finished, um, it was my company's responsibility to validate the data that another contractor was producing. So part of the contract is another company is going to create this data based on uh, American Community Survey um, and decennial data, and my company was going to validate it to make sure that it met all of the all of the definitions of the data. There was a big document that said, you know, this field population was going to come from the decennial data in this field. We had to make sure that matched up. So you can really see there are, there are dozens of different fields here population, number of residential households, uh, number, number of people in group quarters, such as uh, prisons or dormitories, uh, male and female population broke down by three different age groups. Uh, we have uh, different race, race and ethnicities. We have households by income. Um, we've got a uh, number of households that are owned, number of households that are rented, vacant. Um, and finally, we have data on uh, the average rent in a census block or tract and the average home value. So all this data, um, I was effectively tasked with validating to make sure that the contractor who was creating uh, these GIS tables uh, was actually following the, the definitions of where this data was supposed to come from and um, how it related to, to each other. So for instance, all of, the, uh, all of the fields related to household incomes, all those numbers should add up to this value, right? And the same with population, all of the male and female population uh, subcategory should add up to population as should all the uh, race categories. So, um, you could go about this a couple different ways. You could come up with sort of spot checks. I'm gonna check five or 10 random uh, census blocks and uh, make sure that all that math adds up. Um, that's gonna take a long, long, long time. Um, and uh, as this is sort of an iterative process, you have the, um, you have the initial vendor delivering a set of data. I might point out some inaccuracies in it, things that aren't adding up, uh, send it back to them. They send it back to me, I find some more stuff. So if you don't come up with ways to really streamline this process, it's gonna take uh, many, many times over uh, what it could have uh, with using uh, ArcPy and Pandas. So, th so the first, um, test that I was instructed to come up with a way of, of conducting was making sure that uh, all the field names were spelled correctly, uh, they all had the correct field types, and that there were uh, no null values in the document, so um, in the table that is. So for the null values portion, part of the uh, setup within HASIS is supposed to be that there are no uh, null values. If something um, is unknown, that should be a, a zero, or in certain other uh, cases having to do with years, it, sh it should be um, uh, a number like a thousand. So uh, the, the first uh, sort of set, uh, the first code that I came up with um, had to do with uh, find, checking field names against a master list uh, field, field types as well, and, and making sure there are no null values. 
Um, now, could I just get verified that the, the, the text here is readable or do I need to zoom in some? Let's zoom, in. zoom in some if you can. Yeah. Or if you can change it to a black text on white or something, it might show a little. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's good. Yep. So that's cool. beautiful. Not sure how long it would take me to figure out how to change the theme. Um, I'm using Adam oh, if anyone else uh, does that. So <clears throat> I'll go through the code here. I've, I've annotated it um, a bit. Um, I'll try to highlight what I'm talking about like that uh, as I go on. Um, feel free anyone to interrupt um, at any time. But um, my goal is to kind of go over this code and potentially another one, depending on uh, how much time we have. So we're going to start by importing our libraries uh, up top and then getting a user defined uh, input layer. Um, so we're going to set this input variable equal to whatever layer within uh, GIS uh, that the user selects. So that would be that that line of code that I just uh, highlighted there. Get parameter as text. All right, so the first part of this, this code, uh, again, is going to be checking field names and types. So uh, as part of the technical manual for this entire uh, data creation process, um, there are set field names uh, and associated field types within ArcGIS that these, uh, these attribute tables were supposed to be uh, employing. So what I did was I created an Excel document where all of these 64 field names uh, were associated uh, with a matching field type within uh, ArcGIS. So, that, so that's the first step. Create sort of a, a document where these are stored um, that you can reference through Python later. All right. Um, once, once we have that kind of built into the code, uh, we want to see what fields are actually in that input layer that I'm going to be selecting here. So let's say I want to look at DC blocks. So now we're at the part of the code, what fields are actually in uh, DC blocks. Um, important when you use this function of, of ArcPy, this list fields, uh, if, if you're familiar with Python, uh, usually you're going to have like strings probably uh, in a list. Um, within ArcGIS, this list fields function is not going to uh, put strings in there. They're going to be something called field objects. So that comes into play later uh, as I needed to kind of transform that field object data type into a string. Um, so it could actually be read. Um, I'm going to create multiple empty lists for later use. This is kind of just a personal preference of mine. I'd rather put all the lists I'm going to use up top that I, I know are going to need to start empty um, rather than kind of peppering them through the rest of the code. I like to see them up top and make sure that I've defined them uh, early on. Um, similarly, I'm going to create some empty dictionaries. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, Python, uh, a dictionary uh, is sort of a list, but with a key value uh, pair. So kind of one item in that dictionary is going to be, uh, you know, A and, and its value is going to be B. So there's, so there's a pair. Sort of like uh, how we have in this list, a key and a value. So that's where that comes into, into play later. All right. So, um, as I was saying earlier with the field uh, object uh, data type here, I needed to, I, I now had a list of field names, but they weren't strings. So um, I have a for loop here that's, that's just going to uh, append to, uh, to this input field good list, uh, the field object uh, name property here. So uh, for each, uh, for F in input fields, again, this is the list. Uh, I'm going to take that name property and then add it to this. So it's effectively the same list, input fields and input fields good, but one of them is strings, one of them is, is, uh, is field properties, which uh, I wasn't comfortable working with. 
Um, and then uh, I'm going to go ahead and create uh, a dictionary for one of these empty dictionaries I created earlier, where you have uh, the field name and the type. So again, that ideally should be matching here. I'm, I'm reading an attribute table. I'm saying what's the field name and what's its associated type. And the goal is going to be to compare it to these, these pairs here to see if they're all matching up. Um, all right, and then um, I'm going to use a counter uh, within a, a while loop uh, to populate a, a different dictionary uh, using the data frame created from the Excel file. So this dictionary, input field sticks, is going to be uh, pairs of the field names and data types that are actually in the layer that I've uh, decided to look into, DC blocks. Uh, this dictionary down here is going to be key value pairs uh, based on that, uh, that sort of master list down here. So now what I have is two dictionaries that ideally should be the same, right? I want to make sure that that DC blocks layer I'm looking at has all the correct field names and the matching types, but we don't know yet. So now we move into comparing those two different uh, dictionaries. All right, so I have a, a list of uh, ideal uh, fields here. Uh, what we're doing here is we're saying that I want to make a new list out of just the keys in this dictionary. And again, uh, with these Python dictionaries, each you know item in that dictionary is going to have a key and a corresponding value. So I'm telling Python now I'm going to make a list just of all the keys, just the first half of all those pairs. So now I have a list of just this column stored within Python. All right, so now that I have a list of just the ideal field names, I also earlier created uh, a list of uh, all the ideal field names. Uh, I'm gonna populate a list uh, of just the missing field names, right? So. Um, this is not going to tell me if something is, uh, you know, misspelled, if, if population has a second N uh, on the end of it, um, uh, or, or, you know, income 75 to 100 is actually income 75 to 1,000. It's not going to tell me exactly how it's misspelled, but if there's not an exact uh, match in, in these two uh, field lists, it's going to tell me, all right, this, this field name that should be in here is not in that layer that, that you're looking at. Um, at this point, I'm going to add a user message uh, within ArcGIS, and I'll run that tool so you guys can see that. Um, and I'm going to kind of add a custom format here that tells me that, um, you know, I'm going to get the length of this missing fields list, and I'm going to put that here. So maybe there's five missing field names. It's going to say five ideal field names were not found in the input layer, DC blocks. Uh, you know, 10 ideal field names were not found in Alabama blocks. Uh, whatever that input is and whatever that length is, the message is gonna be custom format. Um, uh, and at this point, I'll go and run that tool, but uh, basically I've at this point checked the field names in that layer. And the next step would be checking field types but I pretty much don't want to check uh, if the field types are all correct unless I know all the field names uh, are correct. So we'll run this. We see zero ideal field names were not found uh, in DC blocks. Uh, and then this is the next step we're going to be uh, looking at. Now, um, all these, all these uh, lines of code where I'm adding uh, a message here, that's that's the messages that are uh, coming up there. Where do we go? All right. Um, I highly recommend if if you're ever um, if you're ever coding custom ArcPy uh, messages to unclick this, close the dialog uh, when completed successfully. So the whole point of of this code that I've written is to analyze an attribute table and 
tell me things that are wrong with it, right? So I don't have to go spot checking hundreds and hundreds of different uh, census blocks and census tracks. Um, now, if, if I have this clicked, close the dialog when uh, run successfully, I'm not gonna get a chance to read it before it, it closes, right? So uh, I think that's a, an important thing uh, to keep in mind. You wanna be able to read your own messages. So um, in this DC blocks layer that we've, we've just looked at, uh, that first message told us that there aren't any uh, missing uh, field names. So all the field names, those 64 field names in DC blocks, they all match against uh, the, the list we created from this document that it's referring to. Now we wanna see if all of these field names have the same uh, data type. And a lot of these don't necessarily matter, um, you know, from my perspective as someone who's uh, not really going to be using this data on the end, small integer and integer are, uh, you know, similar data types, just you can have longer numbers and in integer, right? But Again, my job is to validate that data and part of validating that data uh, is making sure that the, the technical manual, which claims that, you know, built 40 to 49 is a small integer, that that's correct. That the, the company that we're helping out validating the data isn't going to submit a product that um, does not live up to the, the FEMA technical manual. All right, so... Um, if, if there uh, are any missing fields, we're adding a message uh, and we're saying uh, field names are not, uh, field types are not going to be checked uh, due to the presence of incorrect field names. And then again, I'm only going to continue checking for uh, the correct uh, field types if there are no uh, missing fields. So if length of missing fields is zero, then I'm going to continue. Um, and then I'm pretty much just going to compare uh, those dictionaries that I created earlier. So I have a list of all the ideal fields and I have two separate dictionaries uh, where that uh, field name is related to a data type. One where uh, it's telling me uh, for that key, the, the, the matching value is uh, the, you know, the, uh, the data type that we want and uh, this one is the data type that actually exists. Um, so if those aren't equal to each other, those matching um, values in those dictionaries, then we're gonna add that field type to a list called wrong type fields. And then we're just going to uh, alert the user whether that um, wrong type fields list is uh, greater than zero. So I'll try to find, um, I've got a bunch of different, so, so for this DC blocks one, uh, there were also no fields uh, that were found to have the wrong field type. And that makes sense because this is kind of the final data, um, but I think some of these other, uh, some of these other uh, deliveries uh, might have some. All right. One of these, I'm sure, that's why I put them here for the presentation. Okay, cool. So one ideal field name uh, was not found in main blocks. Uh, it tells me the, uh, the actual name. So um, I'm gonna guess that this was in originally included as maybe they forgot to put on 5 p.m. or they put an extra T or they dropped off the M. That's going to be something that's very difficult for me to check on uh, manually. So if I wanted to do this uh, manually, I'd really like have to go into the actual feature class, open up the properties, go to the fields tab, and just scroll through this. And again, it was like 65 fields, and it's two for each uh, state uh, plus DC and four territories. So that's at least 110 layers uh, to check and they're being delivered multiple times as inaccuracies are found and re-delivered. So if I'm going through this really quickly, I might not realize that commuting is misspelled. So the, the ease and the, and the benefits of using Python really 
you know, pay for themselves. It might take me, uh, you know, uh, half a day to, to code this entire uh, script, but it's, it's saving me hours and hours and hours uh, in the long run. Um, so let me bring that up one more time. Right, so you see here, we did not check uh, field types uh, since commuting was misspelled. What I would do in that case is that I would just copy the layer, uh, add a new field that's called commuting 5 p.m. and set it equal to all the values and then delete that original field. And then once I run it, it'll tell me that, uh, you know, all the field names are correct and then I can check the field types. So now we are on to the second half of this code, uh, which is looking at uh, null values. Are there, are there any questions before uh, I move on? I guess one question, you used, um, I guess, less than, greater than, instead of not equal to, right? Is that the same in 966? Yeah. Could you have just uh, done like exclamation equal or would that have given you? Something? No, I, I think you're correct. And uh, it's kind of funny that I would use that because in other parts of, of the code, uh, I do use exclamation point uh, equal then. So uh, I guess I was just in that mood. I don't know. That's funny. <laughs> I just wasn't sure if there is a purpose for it or. That was it. Uh, not, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> uh, not you, that I remember. When I when I started understanding the problem you're trying to solve, I just immediately went to doing joins. Like you've got fields you're trying to match against another field. Why not have two data frames that you just join them? And the ones that don't have a match will show up right away. They'll have a column that says, like, oh, these didn't match. As opposed to doing the looping thing, like doing something with the pandas join. Yeah, I think the great thing about uh, coding is there's, you know, way more than one way uh, to do something. So a um, uh, bit about my background. Again, I, I started doing um, Python coding in Professor Mann's um, uh, geospatial programming course uh, at the graduate level. That would have been about 2018. Um, I didn't have... Uh, too much uh, exposure to using Python for the, you know, that the job I had for three years after graduate school. Um, I'm very glad to be getting into it uh, again. Um, but I, I, I do think as I continue to uh, go forward, uh, there are going to be uh, definite ways uh, to improve. Um, but yeah, certainly this is not the only way to do that. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of different ways uh, to do to do that. Um, and part of part of the next uh, code, if we have time to go over, was uh, going to be a, a part where uh, I know there's a big assumption in there that's that could cause problems. It never did, but I was going to see if anyone could point it out. So maybe we'll get there. Um, so, anyways, we're going oh, to. I have one more quick question. So, yeah, as you said, the code didn't take that long to write. Um, I guess how long did you spend? with your colleagues figuring out what is like the best process, the pseudo code, like figuring out which columns you wanted to compare against and stuff. That That's usually why I spent more of my time. So um, that had already been decided before I uh, arrived uh, at the company yeah. in June. So I was pretty much presented with uh, an Excel document and said, these are all the uh, checks that need to be done. You need to make sure there are no null values, that all the field names are correct, that uh, the, the data is summing correctly from the block to the tracked level. Um, you need to make sure that it's matching the source data in different Excel documents. And um, I'm not exactly sure how those checks were arrived at, but my task was to come up with uh, an expeditious way to to check them. And going off uh, the last point that um, uh, there are definitely other ways to do this. Um, I think something that I've that I've realized um, 
in the professional world, which is different from the uh, you know academic world. I remember coding in a couple of uh, Mike Mann's classes and really uh, being challenged to uh, find the most uh, the, the way to code your script, you know, with the least characters effectively, right? You're doing this and it's accomplishing the task, but you could write it this way and it would be half half the lines and would do the same thing. I think something I've, I've realized in the professional world where you're on a, a, a deadline and you're working with other people in your company and other people in other companies is that, you know, once I figured out that this code worked, it was really not in my interest to try to spend time figuring out other ways that it worked or even to um, uh, e even to kind of uh, clean it up more than uh, it was already written. So uh, potentially on a, on a project that was a little more open-ended um, that, that could have happened, but this project was definitely on a strict deadline and, and the other company we were working with was uh, kind of delivering data uh, a little late. So there was there was pressure on my end to you know get it done, okay. um, and and I I think that's important to think about um, you know when I was in the grad school level it was a big a big uh, difference in mindset. Um, so thing. sure. Um, so we want to now test if there are any uh, null. Uh, values in in this attribute table. Um, let's see, create, create a list uh, of fields to check for null values out of the list of all input field names. Uh, okay, so we have uh, again a list of all uh, the field names uh, in this input layer and I don't want to test all of them uh, for null value. Some of them don't really make sense. I don't want to test, um, I don't want to test kind of like shape length uh, and shape area, which if you're not familiar with GIS are two automatically created um, uh, fields that really have nothing to do with this demographics data. I don't really need to, to uh, check this shape column, which tells me it's a polygon or this object ID column. Um, but I want to pretty much check everything else. So um, uh, for some reason, I, I wanted, uh, and it'll be clear later in the code, I wanted census block to be the first item in that list of, of fields to check um, for user messages later, I think. So basically, uh, what this code is doing is saying, uh, for all the input fields, I'm going to create a, a different field of just just uh, fields I want to test for null. Um, and this f dot find thing has been my friend over two companies now. Um, so it's going to search search these uh, field names. So when it finds object ID anywhere in a field name, uh, it's going to come up with a negative one. If it finds shape anywhere in the field name, it's going to come up with negative one. Um, so I'm going to drop those from that uh, from that list, basically. So now I have a, a list of just these uh, fields, not including object ID, not including shape, and not including uh, shape length uh, and area. Um, and and I'm going to use uh, an ArcPy search cursor, which is which is a, a function built into uh, ArcPy um, to search that attribute table for any null values. And in Python, that would be none rather than null. So um, I've got kind of a, a while loop within a for loop here. And how these search cursors work is is it's kind of already going to, uh, this is the standard format of a search cursor. I'm going to specify the input layer and I'm gonna specify a, a list of fields that I want to look in. Now I could have spelled those 60 fields out here, but it's obviously much easier to have them already in a list and have them here. So for each uh, row in that cursor, rows like this, uh, what, what do I want it to do? Well, I want to look at every field in that null test fields. And I want to see if 
every cell in every row, uh, I want to test for none. So um, if it, if so, so this search cursor is effectively going through and saying for the first row, um, what is the value at uh, row zero census block? Is that null? No, it isn't. Then go on to row zero population, row zero households. So once it is completed doing that for the first row, it's going to go on to the second row here. And if I find any null values, uh, it's going to add that to a counter that I've set at zero because I, I pretty much wanted to tell uh, the company that was creating this data, look, I found, you know, out of 5,000 records, uh, I found, you know, 60 null values. And I also wanted to say there were 15 in this field and 30 in this field and, you know, 15 in another field. Um, so this part of the code is effectively saying um, for any null value you find, add the field name to a separate list, uh, but only if it's not in there already. I, I didn't need to have a, a, a list of, you know, if there are uh, 15 values in the uh, income over 100,000 uh, field, I didn't need to have income over 100,000 in there 15 times. I really only needed it in there once. So uh, at the end of this, I have a total number of null values. If there are any, I have a list of all the unique field names that have null values. And uh, I am then going to tell uh, the user uh, using uh, select by uh, layer, I'm going to select uh, any, any, uh, any rows where uh, that field is null. Right, so I have a list of those null fields. I'm going to create an SQL uh, and I'm going to, to select uh, by attribute anywhere where that uh, field is null. And uh, how that works, you see up here. Is that when it's done, there should be uh, a selection on the screen. So there was only uh, one field in uh, main blocks that had uh, any null values. It was average rent. Average rent is not populated for 1946,210 uh, records. If there was another one, it would you know, be 29 null values and it would be 19 and 10. So uh, it would, it, it's, this acts the same way as if I went up to selection and said select by attributes, you know, population is null. And then you can actually see uh, uh, on the map uh, where there are null values, if there's any geographic bent to them here for some reason, except for this one, they all seem to kind of be on that same longitude. Um, I don't know why that would be, but all that, uh, all this stuff was important for me to tell to that vendor, right? And so a lot of this was, um, you know, I would, I finished uh, the code up to this point and then I realized, well, I really need to know exactly what fields are null and I wanna be able to say how many uh, null values within each field. Um, any uh, questions on, uh, on this code? Um, each of these tests would represent a different code that I scripted. Um, happy to go over more, Ryan. Up to you uh, what we have time for. Um, let me see what time is it even. Oh yeah, we're coming up on the end. So we should probably stop there and see if sure. anybody has questions. Um, oh, but, yeah, I just want to say, I, I really like the idea of having the data dictionary as it's like a separate uh, spreadsheet that you read in. That's kind of, I never thought of doing that before. Treating it as data itself, um, rather than like hard coding the data types into the data cleaning code. So that was something I, maybe I'll try to take with me. Sure, thank you. And putting all your dictionaries in empty list at the top was 
I hadn't thought of that. I usually just put them in right above where I use it. Um, but of course, no one ever reads my code other than me. So it might not really matter. But yeah, your documentation was good formatting. Like if anyone else came to it, they would figure out what you were doing pretty easily, which was nice. Um, well, it would be disingenuous of me to say that I added all these annotations when I originally wrote the code and not because <laughs> I was doing the presentation. But um, I was glad that I, when I added them, because I, I think going back over the code um, within the last few days for this presentation, uh, you know, it would have been easier if I had written this to begin with. And I think it's very easy to say to yourself, well, you know, I wrote this script. I'm not going to forget what line 47 does, but you write this script and then you write five more in the next two weeks. And it is kind of hard. And it also makes it easier because a lot, you know, a lot of these scripts kind of build off each other. This script um, uh, adds up uh, different fields. Like, as I was saying, all of the male population uh, field, that should equal the three uh, subcategories for male. Um, all the household built by decade field should equal household. So that's what this is doing. It's it's using a search cursor to say the sum of all these all these rows is that going to equal this one? You know, I use this same code um, in 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 different scripts. Um, this script I I was probably the most proud of in the project. It um uh, it. Uh, calculated for all the fields that were summed up from the block to the track level if that math uh, was correct. But I first had to make sure that there were the same uh, uh, number of uh, block uh, and track values between them. So you end up using the same code between a lot of different scripts. It's going to help you to uh, annotate them as you go forward. So I have a question, not that I'm, you know, trying to make you out yourself, but how, did you know how to do everything or or were there times in this code writing process that you went to uh, our good friend Google, like you had a sense of what you wanted to do and then you started searching around to see within Python, is there a function to do this or did you kind of say, all right, you know, I, I understand loops. I have a good grasp of loops. This is how I'm going to approach this problem. Yeah, um, I certainly wouldn't, uh, you know, call it out of myself. I have no issue whatsoever uh, uh, admitting that Google is your best friend. Um, <laughs> even stuff that I know how to do but just haven't done in a year or in six months. It's, it's good to... Um, <clears throat> check on something before you write it. You know, if, if I'm kind of arrogant and say, well, I know how to do this, I've done it before, and then I write it and it's not working, it's not working, I'm gonna end up Googling it anyway. So I might as well Google it the first time to make sure that I get all the, the letters in the right place. So I think a good example of that um, is that I you can't make a pandas data frame directly from uh, a feature class attribute table. So again, a pandas data frame is just uh, it's in my mind, it's just a, it's just an Excel table within, within, uh, uh, within Python. So I can't, I can't just, this is the same thing. Pandas is going to be the same thing. It's going to be a list of rows and a list of columns and values at the intersection, but I can't just read in there. So, um, I had figured out a way to do that for a different project a while ago using this code here. And this code I got probably from Stack Exchange and um, it was just not working. It was taking a long, long, long time. I Even this I did write at the time that I abandoned it due to processing time, but it does work. Um, so uh, Google led me to um, NumPy arrays and NumPy arrays, to my understanding, are very similar to Pandas data frames, but you can create a NumPy array directly from that attribute table down at the bottom, and then you can make a Pandas data frame out of the NumPy array. So I certainly had no idea how to do that uh, before. Um, but yeah, don't don't uh, be embarrassed about Googling stuff. I don't I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, with that. That's why websites like 
Stack Exchange exist, right? Because people need people need uh, help from one another. I have one question. Yep, another question from here. And this is about this is like a very bad one. It's about the code for um, what was it again? Like checking for no ver no values like that. Kind of like next nested loop in a while loop. You use the counter there. And I kind of spent like five minutes when you were on there trying to figure out how the while loop works, but I still have no clue. And it would be just interesting to know. Hmm. For this script. The file you were presenting. Yeah, then scroll down. down. There's also a while loop up at the top there. Just, I don't know. If you go to like the end, I'll be able to tell you. Oh uh, yeah, right there. The count less than max one. Right. So I think this is um, uh, max is just what I called the number of, of null test fields. So um, there are like 60 fields that I'm going to test, right? So this max is going to say that's 60, right? So uh, the search cursor is going to search through every row, but it's usually just doing one thing per row. It's going to say like, uh, like in this one. Um, for this row, is the value in one field equal to the sum of value in six other fields, right? And then it's going to move on to the next row. But for this code, I wanted to not only loop vertically through the rows, but I had to loop horizontally through all the uh, uh, columns as well. So um, to call a field in a search cursor, it's going to be uh, like row, uh, row zero, right? So um, row zero would be the first, the value in that row for the first item in this list. And then the row one would be the value in that row for the second item uh, in this list, which is a different field name. So what I was, what I was doing here is I was, the max is the the item uh, index in the list of null test fields. Okay, thank you. So, right. So it would be, uh, is row, I'm on this row, right? Is row zero census block null? No. Is row one population null? And again, who knows if there's a better way to do that. But uh, I think that's just how a lot of coding I find is just how does your mind work? Uh, how do the puzzle pieces fit together in your mind? Thank you. Well, great. We're at time. So first of all, I want to thank you, Ryan, for coming back and sharing with us. Um, it's always great to see that our programs around GW are working. Uh, I did email Dr. Mann to tell him you were doing this. I don't know if he joined online. He might have been one of our online. I saw he posted on uh, the LinkedIn Geography Department alumni group. So, yeah, yeah, we had him present maybe two years ago. The video is on the website if you want to watch. He did something with census data as well. I yeah. don't remember exactly what he did. Um, well, great. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, and Thank you again, Ryan, and we'll talk sure. to you soon. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yay. That'd be great.